liberty and justice for all. I'll let JD introduce our guests. Okay, so we have um, Dub Austin with Indian Territory Quail Forever with us today. Um, Rosie and Sam Munhollum from the Oklahoma Station chapter of Safari Club International. Uh, Laura McIver, of course, here with us with Quail Forever on the agenda today. Rick Nolan with National Wild Turkey Federation. Hey, Rick. Rick Grunman, the head of the Wildlife Conservation Foundation, is here. R.C. and Phyllis Brown, who are uh, will be recognized later on the agenda. Um, got Doug Scholing and John Hendricks from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with us as well. Thank you for being here. And then a bunch of red shirts in the crowd, which we're going to hear about a little bit later. So thank you all. We'll try to do it quick on the agenda so you don't have to sit through uh, all the rest of the boring stuff, okay? <laughs> and thank you all for being here. Okay, we've got some awards to present. One, turn it on. One um, longevity award today, and that is for um, Bill Dinkins and his 30 years of service. Bill started with us in August of 1991. Uh, his first job with the department was actually, I guess, in February of 91 doing um, clerical work, editing deer, uh, deer books, making $4.81 an hour. I, that's about <laughs> how I started right out of college, too, doing wow. temporary field work for the water board, making about that minimum wage. Uh, Bill never runs from a fight. We can talk about all kinds of them that he's led us through, whether it's uh, McAllister Army Ammo Depot, switch to traditional archery only, or the southeast turkey season restrictions, all of which happened when he was the Southeast Regional Supervisor, so he's been through some fun ones. Uh, when he was doing his master's research at Fort Sill, apparently he slept on a cot in the back of the office and cooked on a hot plate, so he's been through some rugged times, too. <laughs> he's known for his interest in deer and turkey hunting, also a good wing shooter and loves quail and dove hunting, too. He grew up quail hunting out west with his dad and some favorite bird dogs, a lot like my story, Bill. Uh, he's a meticulous detail guy that always does his homework. As a young man, Bill knew he wanted a career in wildlife, and after 30 years, he has the same passion for his work as he did the first day he went to work. He's a new grandpa and will soon have a second grandbaby. Bill's a great team player with a lot of common sense and valuable institutional knowledge, and I'll just add that he had the, he had the pleasure of guiding me on a turkey hunt way back in the day when I was in the Secretary of Environment's office, and the Secretary of Environment at the time figured out a way to horn us in on a turkey hunt. He had gotten to meet, at the time, Commissioner Ritter down in southeast Oklahoma and, and figured out how to weasel an invitation down there. At the time, Bill was southeast. Were you turkey biologist at the time? Yeah. So um, Ritter guided the Secretary, and, and Dinkins um, guided me. So when I got this job, he said, now you're not going to, you're, you're forgetting that time I guided you on a turkey hunt and you didn't get a turkey, right? <laughs> said, no, I haven't forgot. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, we couldn't ask for a better guy. I'm so We're so fortunate that we were able to lure him into Oklahoma City when so many folks that excel out in the field don't want to come in and, and work here at the Puzzle Palace, but we appreciate your willingness to serve and your dedication and sacrifice all these years. Bill Dinkins, 30 years of service. I, uh, thanking the good Lord, we're just blessed to be here. I mean, am I right? Yep. It's a true blessing Amen. to be here. And JD mentioned it. You know, I looked back on my career and I knew what I wanted to do. And at the time, there weren't any jobs open. And you know, even getting out of Oklahoma State with a master's degree, I was willing to work for four dollars an hour just to get my foot in the door at OVWC. And I mean, the rest is history. It's paid off. You know, I've had a long. 30 years, great years. Um, it's exciting to me to see people like even our own director kill his first pronghorn in Oklahoma uh, this past week. So to see people still able to go out and enjoy, you know, the things that we work so hard to manage and protect, uh, it, it's, it's all well worth it. Um, 
as far as the job, it's with the dedicated and professional staff in Wildlife Division makes rough my job easy, you know, sitting up here. Well, maybe not all that easy, but <laughs> overall, um, you know, I appreciate their their de dedication and sacrifice, and, and obviously I appreciate the commission support, and uh, we still got a lot of good work to do, so thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you for 30 years. Wow. Okay. Um, Nell, you've got a presentation. Commissioners, um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce Colin Berg. Colin is our um, education, information education supervisor. He focuses on the education program, communication and education. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning our name myself. <laughs> so. But Colin is one of the division's <clears throat> longest tenured employees, um, and he's been the guiding force in our getting our outdoor skills into school classrooms. Um, and the things that you should know about Colin is he's flexible, adaptable, and very progressive in his thinking. Nels, I appreciate that. Some people think I'm hard-headed, so <laughs> that's what I was thinking. But. <laughs> <laughs> You already introduced me. I want to introduce my staff. I've got great staff that work. That I work alongside. They allow me to work alongside them sometimes. Most of the time they ask me to stay at the office. But <laughs> Damon's been with us for 21 years. He's in charge of our scholastic shooting sports program and our step program. A lot of folks have seen him uh, out there doing all those programs. Skyler St. Ives is, is our uh, Kid fishing uh, coordinator, R3 coordinator. He does our fishing programs and our R3 efforts on the fishing side. Sean Gee, who's there in the blue shirt, is, uh, has been with us eight years. Sean actually piloted a lot of our outdoor ed programs. We stole him from Coweta School District. He works with us, does all of our outdoor education stuff and communication things out of the Jenks office with me. Jason Smith, who's on the far right there, been with us seven years. He helps Damon with the scholastic shooting sports and step program and a couple years ago took over the uh, duties of managing the area out at Arcadia. Uh, he manages the land area. Kelly Boyer who's down there on the bottom left. You're going to get to meet him here in just a little bit. He's going to introduce the Locust Grove team. He's almost been here two years. Be two years in October. He's our archery in the schools. Everything archery coordinator. Um, but does everything. Casey Harriet uh, is actually a, a, a person that started with the agency and now she works for the NWTF as our R3 coordinator on the hunting side. Lance Meek, who's our hunter education coordinator and shooting range coordinator, has been with us 19 years, and then Jennifer Benz, 14 years. She's a uh, technician here out of the central office for our hunter education and our outdoor ed program. So that's the people that actually make things happen. I just get to sit back and watch them do all of this stuff. Um, it's been three years since I've given a presentation to the commission, so there's several folks that are new. So it's a good time to introduce what we have been doing the last 17 years, really, that we started with the Archery in the Schools program. It's all built off of what Bruce Matthews identified back when I first started 28 years ago with the department. He was at Cornell. He said people need a first time positive threshold experience, they need access to equipment, access to the resource, a guide, and social support. And a lot of those things have to stay in place for a long time for people to actually become lifelong hunters and anglers. Well, there's also a lot of research that Mark Duda said uh, years ago when I first started and became the education supervisor and started reading the research and trying to apply it. He said if, if state wildlife agencies want uh, their constituents to and residents of their states to grow up uh, appreciating what the state wildlife agencies do. They need to get their programs into the schools and, and it be top of mind uh, in that area. And that's what we've done. It started with archery in the schools back in 2004 with eight schools. Uh, I think Locust Grove actually came on the second or third year with that. Brad can probably back that up. And progressively, we've gone from anywhere from 50 schools per year down to around 15 to 20 schools per year that we add, add new schools. And we still have new schools coming on board after 17 years that 
We'll call Kelly or he'll have an email when he gets back. He's actually got a training today that he's done for new schools or one new school. I think most of them are retrainees that are coming through, new teachers that are existing schools that are taking over for teachers that retired or moved on and schools are back filling them. So it just amazes me that we've been doing it this long and the common thing will be, hey, I heard about this archery program. We want to get involved in it. And it's like, where have you been if you just now <laughs> heard about it? But actually most of how people hear about it in most cases is uh, like any of you all, most all of y'all are business owners yourselves that are on the commission. Word of mouth, positive word of mouth is how things happen. It's teachers to teachers, administrators to administrators. We don't spend a lot of time or money promoting our programs because we only have so many kits that we can give out each year. And so it kind of grows on its own. You see last year we had a decline due to COVID in participation because a lot of schools just did not meet face to face. We were one of the only states in the country that's part of this program that actually had an in-person shoot last year. It was for our top state uh, qualifiers. We did virtual shoots as well for our tier two schools, but the team that's here today uh, won our state shoot, and you're gonna hear about them winning a bigger shoot as well. But we were able to pull that off, and it's because of staff and their ability to adapt. As Nell said, we always adapt. We're always looking forward. NAST is a big deal. If, you, if people don't understand it, it is a big deal in Oklahoma and across the country. Uh, these schools have got their own Facebook pages. They get tremendous amounts of donations for their school or for their kids to participate in these programs. It takes a lot of money, particularly if they end up going to a national shoot to be able to go to that shoot. But just to participate in Oklahoma, it takes quite a bit of money on the school system. And they're proud of it. They are proud of being involved in the program. The next program that we added after archery, archery, they did some studies, the National Archery and Schools program did with the students that were participating. Again, we pay attention to research. The students said when they were asked that were involved in the programs, Oklahoma nationally, we're interested in more. We're interested in more hunting related curriculums, more fishing related curriculums, more about the outdoors. So we didn't just sit back and go, oh, that's great that they're interested. We actually listened to them and brought other opportunities. Explore Bow Hunting came along. It's an archery trade association curriculum that we implement here in Oklahoma cooperatively with the ATA. Uh, you can see we've got 465 schools compared to 650 schools that were doing archery in the schools. 465 have now got kits that do Explore Bow Hunting. More of them do them in the junior high and high school than the elementary school, but we do provide elementary schools kits um, they just don't provide them, use them in all their classes. It's an elective class usually. Again, you see that the numbers go down, um, but it's really popular. That in a lot of cases, archery, they spend about 10 weeks. Uh, explore bow hunting, they'll spend three to four weeks teaching that curriculum. Uh, then we had fishing in the schools. Came along after explore bow, explore bow hunting. We developed our own fishing curriculum. Barry, who's in the room, challenged me when I started my first job with the Aquatic Ed Coordinator to develop a fishing curriculum. I didn't pull it off, um, but one of my <laughs> staff members who now is, is uh, working with our, uh, in our website, Daniel Griffiths, pulled it together and made it happen. Um, followed the model that we did with our Hunter Ed curriculum. We've got our own fishing in schools curriculum, and it's going great guns everywhere from the most rural school district to the most urban districts that you have. Owasso, Jinx, down here in the Oklahoma City area, Mustang, Moore, schools are doing these curriculums. So it's not just kids that live on the farm. Even kids that live on the farm don't do this stuff anymore. They play video games just like these kids play video games until Brad brought all the stuff into their school system. That was just what everybody was thinking about. It's a big deal. That's Owasso School District down on the right-hand side doing a fishing clinic, just or their fishing in schools program. They're outside of their school. Became so big at Owasso that Frank is in the eighth grade there that he's got his own classroom besides gymnasium that he's able to do these activities in. And now he's got a new facility that they gave him that he doesn't have to take his stuff down from inside the gym so he can leave everything set up. Um, and they've added it now in the elementary and high school. Muskogee, it's also adaptable physical, um, uh, special education courses. We've got kids that participate that of all different abilities uh, we have. We have had kids in wheelchairs come to our state shoot. We've had 
students that were blind at our state shoot that had a person that was helping them line up in our archery shoot. Um, just all different students. These things are great. They're easy. And we saw with COVID that everybody really does like the outdoors. It's just when you take all the other things away that are taking kids away and adults away from the outdoors, they turn immediately back to it. We saw it happen this last year. It took a pandemic to make people go out. And hopefully we can keep them because they should have realized that it's just as fun sitting on a fishing bank with your child as it is hollering at them at a baseball game or a softball game or a soccer game. So um, scholastic shooting sports started eight years ago. We've got 205 high schools and another about 80 junior high programs. Brad's again in that program. Their high school's in it. They do really well in that as well. Um, it's a shotgun-based program, trap-based program that we've been running for the last eight years, modeled it after NAS. Um, I usually have a slide up here that has kids coming off their school bus with their shotguns in hand. We're one of the only states in the country that you're going to see that happen. They can bring their guns to school. They can carry them on their school bus, transport them, right, Brad? So nothing better than seeing that, and that's what Duda was talking about, was that makes it socially acceptable for your son, your daughter, your grandson, or granddaughter to talk about hunting and shooting sports in their classroom because it's happening day in and day out in our schools. And so the kids that are doing it are able to share that with the kids that aren't doing it. And then the ones that aren't doing it are like, I think I want to try that. So that's why it's so important to do these things like we're doing it in Oklahoma, trying to convince other states to do it, but they're just not made up the way that we are in a lot of cases, just locked up. There's a school bus picture. We even have them up there at Drummond. They've built their own little trap range so that they can practice. Um, that's what it looks like, the kids coming off the school bus with their guns. We provide all the ammunition so they're not supposed to be transporting firearms. But you look on down the line, if, uh, top photo there, uh, you can see there's shooting teams that's at the state shoot all down the line. And what you can't see is all the crowd that's sitting in the shade trees back there watching their kids shoot out at the state shoot. So it's grown tremendous popularity. I remember Richard, when we uh, were inheriting the SEP program back, he said, you all are going to get the SEP program back in the education programs. And we said, the only way we're taking it back is we're going to change it. He's like, what are you going to do with it? And we're going to make it a in-school curriculum, still do some of the open to the public shooting events that we've been doing, but we're going to turn it into a school curriculum. The SEP was actually born because of non-toxic shot. These kids don't know anything but non-toxic shot. All of us here that are 50 and above, like myself, um, despised non-toxic shot when it first came out. And so we developed the STEP program, which was to train hunters to embrace steel because it was like, this stuff is no good, we can't harvest ducks, it's no good on geese, and we had to show them that it actually is good, it just performs differently than your lead shot does. And you need to be a little bit better shooter <laughs> than you have to be with lead. <laughs> Um, but it's great to see. It's so fun to see these schools show up. The next program we added, another one. We weren't done. We added Explore Bow Fishing. Uh, we've got 300 schools. This is now, again, a national program that the Archery Trade Association has. We buy our schools a uh, $500 kit. You'll see this here in just a little bit that attaches to the, the uh, NAS bows that they can use. And you can see the activity. That's up actually at the Wildlife Expo where we usually have that activity set up. But School kids do it in the classroom. Brad, again, teaches his program at his school. Um, varsity archery is the most recent program that we added. We added it the year that COVID hit. Um, luckily, we were able to have it at the, the archery shoot that year. We're one of the leaders, again, in, in starting this program. There's other states that are following our lead. They can use this bow, actually goes up to 40 pounds. They can hunt with it. Um, they only shoot at a turkey target. We designed that target. The first thing that we heard from the kids is, you can't see the lines. Exactly. <laughs> you don't know. You can't see the lines on a turkey. you got to pick a spot. You know, we're not shooting at a target face like they do in NASP. We're shooting at a, tar at a turkey target. And so there's <coughs> small lines in there that show where, the, where it's at, but you can't see it from 10 or 15 meters unless you have really good eyes. Um, but the kids use the exact same bow, but it's got a release, it's got a side, it's a stabilizer, it's more like a hunting bow. We want to transition our students in, particularly this is a high school only program, into when they graduate high school, we want them walking out with a bow 
in their hand. We'd like to have already turned them into a hunter, but we want them to realize that there's, there is more than the NAS bows out there, and it doesn't end at, high, at the end of high school. You can shoot the rest of your life. You can even make a living shooting a bow if you get good enough. There's some people that are that good. Um, this, this year, we'll have varsity archery again at our state shoot. In the future, after this year, we're going to have a high school NASP only shoot, and then the high school that will be at our state shoot that will be elementary and junior high kids with NASP bows will be shooting varsity archery equipment. Because we want those kids that are younger, like we did the very first year we saw it, when we had a range set up with these turkey targets and these different bows, kids migrated and parents migrated over there like, well, what are they doing? We've never seen this before. It's a new program. We want to shoot those bows. We want you to shoot those bows. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've already got 54 schools and we've got another 35 kits lined up that we're going to be putting into the school system here this next year. Um, it's growing like crazy, popular, and like I said, they can actually hunt with them once they get to 30 pounds. We also do, started years ago, one of the first things ever through the schools was our FFA uh, program that we do, the clay target program. It's been modified, it's actually a four stand setup. They bring four kids. We provide all the ammunition and, and the firearms, FFA, even though FFA kids participate in our scholastic program, our trap based program, where they can have up to 15 team members and transport their own firearm. FFA is through Career Tech. We've talked to them and talked to them. They won't let their teachers, through their program, transport firearms. If their teachers participate in our program, <laughs> they transport their own firearms. But we provide uh, double barrels that they do, um, and those take place in the fall of the year. There's around 340 teams. This is where we recruited our first scholastic shooting sports program students from was the FFA program. We marketed it directly to them. Anytime we've launched a new program, if you're already in our system, you get first dibs, and then once, the, once we re usually reach the third year, we start offering it to new schools so that uh, everybody gets a chance if they want to to jump on board. Some of them jump on board right away. Some of them takes them a little while to be convinced that the next best thing is the next best thing. We even do hunter education, varsity archery, FFA, and scholastic shooting sports. All those students have to have hunter education. We train every teacher now. They can do either use our own curriculum or they can have their students get technology credit using the online course. Um, you know, we have a very liberal law in Oklahoma. Anybody under 30 and under can hunt as an apprentice. The only way you can hunt in Oklahoma under 10 and under is, is an apprentice. Some states, you can only do it one time. Some states, two times. We said, hey, learned again. Texas originally started the apprentice program, and they said, we've been doing it. We can't get people to actually follow through and take the course. They've been doing it for like three years, and only like 15% were following through and taking the course. And we said, well, the logical thing <laughs> is to just say, you can, as long as you hunt as an apprentice, you can do it all you want. We want you to go hunting. Because the average person that they're trying to get to do the hunter education course, in a lot of cases, was adults that are getting invited to go on a pheasant hunt or a quail hunt or through their work environment in a lot of cases, and it's like, that's not top of mind. So they never get around to taking the hunter education course. They get invited every year, but they don't ever take their hunter education course. We just made it easy and said, here's our rules, follow them. You can do it as many times as you want. Budget. We have a budget specifically for our education kits. This year it's over $240,000 worth of kits that we're buying. That gives us 15 of our NAS kits. We had an excess of NAS kits, so we didn't buy 25 this year. We just bought 15. Um, those are $2,215. A school, this is one program they have to come up with uh, part of the equipment. They have to buy the targets, the bow racks, the repair kit, and the arrows. Um, when they get trained, they buy that, we give them their stuff, they sign a grant agreement that they're going to implement this program for at least uh, three years. We now have two, three different training programs. One for varsity archery, it's a full day training, one day for scholastic shooting sports if you want to do it, and then we do a two day training for everything else that I'm going to talk about here. So. Fishing in schools, the, right around $720, was $500 until last year. Everybody looking for fishing stuff, you can't find it. 
supply and demand. Demand goes up, supply goes down, and cost goes up along with it, just like everything else. But we're in the process of getting those new kits. We'll start 25 new schools. So when a school signs that agreement, they agree to implement NAS. They agree to implement our OK Fit. They agree to implement Explore Bow Hunting, which is a $2,300 kit. Comes with all kinds of neat stuff, trail cameras, game types of bows, everything that you need to learn about uh, in the outdoors, some camouflage, uh, broadheads, practice broadheads, everything that the teachers can use in the classroom along with the curriculum uh, that they use. Our Explore Bow Fishing Kit is around $600 now. Uh, they get five bottle reels and arrows and practice kits and the, the ATA curriculum that we give them. Uh, our Scholastic Shooting Sports Program, they get a $2,300 kit that basically comes with a clay target thrower, I think 20 boxes of clay, three boxes of hearing and eye protection, and a gun safe. We do not give ammo and we don't give out firearms. Um, the Varsity Archery Kit comes with 10 bows and all those attachments that you see with it right there. I would be remiss if I didn't end my presentation by talking about the fact that every school is a partner that we have. We could not do this. It's not our staff. It's the schools. It's, that's the only way that this is scalable. When I first started, we were going to schools and doing these things for one day. Okay? Our staff would go do it for one day. Now it's in the school, and they do it at their leisure. Brad does it every day. He teaches these kids every day one of these things. They're doing something every day in the outdoors. It's outdoors related. Way more effective than a one day experience with the agency. Schools, every one of them is our partner. Sam Munholland with Safari Club, they've given us a lot of money over the years for these programs. Quail Forever, Pheasants Forever is in the room. They've given us money, time, and they're going to give us more money later today, I think. <laughs> Partners for Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they give us money on top of our general money that we get from the Fish and Wildlife Service. They actually help. Now they're paying for our nets. They were paying for rental facility this year. They're paying for the printing on all of our nets. National Wild Turkey Federation, another partner that's in the room. So it's not just the agency. It's not just the staff within the education. You saw our eight-member staff. It's everybody. Probably everybody in this room has come out at one point in time and helped. We've had commissioners that have come and helped. A JD, first year, he came out and pushed the button for the shoot-off and the competition. He's a brave man because <laughs> we actually now we don't push the button at all. <laughs> we get the kids to come up there because that's the one point when, hey, you messed me up. You didn't push it. I yelled. You know, in 30 mile an hour wind blowing in your face and 52 year old old man, I can't hear. <laughs> so we, hey, I'm not 52. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we let the kids pull now, and we have a score and a collar at the state, sh at the regionals and state shoots. It's enjoyable. My staff loves doing it. I love doing it. Our agency loves being in front of the folks. It is the time, one time when we're doing our competitions that they see the agency, they see the face that, that goes along with the agency, and it helps them realize that, that you know, we did surveys. A couple years ago at our state shoots, and 90% of the people, the participants at the state shoots that, that OSU surveyed, these are adults, were able to name that it was the wildlife department that was putting on the shoot at our, for our state archery shoots and our shotgun shoots. So that means they're seeing us, they see our logo, our teachers do a great job of explaining who's in charge of the program and running it for them, so that's worth a tremendous amount to the agency as far as recognition of these popular programs, that there's no issues to the school system. So I always appreciate the opportunity to address the commission. Like I said, it's been three years uh, since I've been up here, and three gentlemen are maybe hearing this for the first time. Altus has got a tremendous program going down there. Enid, we've had a few programs in and out. Visit with Mr. Kane about trying to get Bartlesville going. So. It, a lot of cases, it's just finding the teacher or the administrator that says, yeah, we should be doing this uh, because our kids will enjoy it, and they're activity-based. They're not sitting. They're active-based, and they love them. So all they got to do is give us a call. But they won't get trained this year until June and July because Kelly, this is end of September. He's done training. All the folks that are up there, we go do all the other programs. When we start FFA programs, all of our education staff are done helping run those shoots. 
so we don't have time to do our training that, that time of year. It takes place June through September. Any questions? Alan, uh, how many uh, schools are on the waiting list? You used to have a waiting list. Is there still a waiting list to get on? Yeah, they'll still. <laughs> Kelly will start accumulating people, like I said. We pretty much have trained, caught up with most everybody right now that wants. But as we go through the school year, we start gathering up uh, schools, and usually by the end of the school year, we'll have 25 or 30 schools each year. We'll already have our next year's worth of kits spoken for. And usually we try to have those kits on hand, so as soon as we train them, between June and September, like the new school that's coming, they've signed the agreement, they walk out the door with this kit. Um, that way, uh, if we had more, we would advertise, Jim, um, but if we had more kits, we just don't have time. To keep, we've, we've amassed so many different things that we're doing, and like I said, the summertime is the time to train the teachers, and we're maxed out. Now we're having to re retrain a lot of new teachers that are replacing, like I said, we're probably doing twice as many, if not three times as many replacement teachers. We've been in existence long enough that the new teacher comes on board. Hey, Jim, you're going to teach this program. What do I do? And you've got to go to a training. So they don't get a kit, but we have to train their teachers. So is, is it a matter of limited resources that you can't uh, get them off the waiting list or uh, availability of equipment? I mean, what's, what's the hold up on? It would be, we hold them off until we get to our training period. If, if I had more staff, we could do training year round and you could be adding them as they came on board. But, you know, again, it just goes back to every one of our training dates. How many have you had this year, Kelly? 11. 11 trainings and there's around 20 that until we just implemented 12 for our COVID protocols recently, but 20 teachers that participate oh. usually on average on those. So you're looking at 200 teachers that are being trained this year to do the program. So it's, it's one of those things, uh, I mean, if we, if we had more money, you end up not having time to be able to get more teachers through the training courses, because it's, it's a two-day course, and then if they do all of them, their high school, they end up with four days of training. So. Well, it sounds like the pace is about right. It sounds like we can, we can train 20 to 30 new new ones a year and that's about what comes to us right. saying they're interested in it right yeah there's not a backlog necessarily anymore we're just kind of keeping right pace. we've gotten ahead of the curve on it uh, where there used to be uh, a backlog and we used to train 50 because NASP was the only program we were doing as we started adding these programs we did get some budget add-ons but then we would split money out to be able to equally bring them along but we're not backfilling that's that's the model now is we don't just say here's one program because they're going to come back and want the next one and then it's just a nightmare you're trying to sift out well, who's getting what kit who's being here for just part of this day this day or this day so we just mandate if you want it you're gonna you can buy it all on their own but they all want it all uh, they don't back off when we say you're going to want to do all of it but most of the time it's either they're calling about scholastic shooting sports or NASP because that's the ones that have the competitions that they're aware of. And we educate them again about, oh, there's the other programs. You look in your closet and you've got all this other stuff, these new teachers, and it's like, oh, yeah, I see there's fishing rods in there. Yeah, we, you've got to come to your second day so you get training on that. Well, Colin, you and your staff are doing a great job, and I can't think of a better program for these yeah, school students than, yeah. than these kind of programs that you're putting on. So. Thank you. Ditto that. Yeah. We appreciate Commissioner it. Dillingham has a question, I believe. Yeah, Colin, I agree. Uh, great, great presentation, great program, great numbers, uh, participation. I just was curious across the programs, what kind of uh, crossover of students do you have? And then what kind of retention do you have as they progress through the grades, you know, uh, on the programs? Do you have any idea or do we track that? We, we now, through the uh, using the Hunter Ed numbers, we're able to get those to the high school kids that are participating in those programs that I talked about that require it. Sadly, at the first, we didn't start asking. We didn't have a system even to get them into. We've now got a customer ID where they don't have to have a license. They can create a customer ID, and we're talking about doing that for all of our programs just to get them a customer ID to register for even a NASP shoot so that we have that ability to track. 
it all varies. Some schools, they only get one year of it. These kids at Locust Grove, they may go through it every year. Now they've got it elementary through high school. They could go 10 years through the program. It's just elective courses. So it just varies by student. Some of them, some of them are there every year. Some of them, Brad, are, is like, man, I thought, I thought they'd already graduated. <laughs> <laughs> They're still here. So, and that's the same. I, we see them at the state shoot, and these kids that are at the top level, if, when you have them up there on the podium, it's like, you've been up here since you were in elementary school or something because you look real familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it just varies. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Colin, and your staff and the partnering agencies for all you do for getting these programs going and growing in our Oklahoma schools. Yeah. It's awesome. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Speaking of shooting sports, a special group of kids to show. As Colin mentioned, Kelly Boyer joined um, the Communication and Education Division um, almost two years ago. And I was going to fill in a few blanks for you there. He's, um, he is an OSU grad. <laughs> no folks. I know how that's um, really important, right? And an avid archer. He's, he's um, also an archery hunter himself. Um, he takes his role and responsibility in... Um, in sharing the uh, archery gospel very seriously. He coordinates all things archery for the department, um, including the regional and state shoots, which are is, um, big time projects in and of themselves. Um, and I'm, before I turn it over to Kelly, I do want to say to Locust Grove, you all have the coolest uniforms. <laughs> so neat. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, so 2020 and 2021 were kind of a tumultuous time for our schools. Um, they had to go through something they've never gone through before, and uh, we were right there with them along the way. Um, as Colin said before, national archery in the schools is a very big deal, and it's a very big deal in Oklahoma. But not only is it a very big deal in Oklahoma, it's a very big deal across the nation. Um, we are very proud and very strong in our archery shooting in our schools. And uh, I have the privilege of introducing and presenting to you commission um, a very special group of young individuals. This year, NAS, um, National Archery in the Schools, made the very difficult decision to go to an all virtual national shoot. This allowed over 15,000 competitors to shoot in a national shoot. In Locust Grove, is in the middle school division, there were just over 7,000 competitors and 288 teams, and I'm proud to present to you, Commissioner, and everyone else, your 2021 National Champion Middle School NAS Team, Locust Grove. Would you guys please stand and be recognized? <laughs> you've made. Thank you guys. Awesome. Awesome. Congratulations. Wow. It's just amazing. Wow. National record. Wow. wow. Making us proud. You bet. Yeah. 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 That's so cool. Ma Madam Chairman, I have a question um, to the our student athletes. Who's going to make the Olympic team in their life? Let's see those hands. Somebody's going to have to shoot in the Olympics. <laughs> yes, please, Brad. Yeah, if you don't mind coming to the mic, just because we, we're streaming it online. Thank you. Uh, I just want to tell you guys also, we had a few kids here that aren't with our middle school team. We have uh, Maddox Parks. Can you stand, Maddox? Uh, Maddox is a junior this year. Uh, this past year, he was the uh, 3D national champion. Nice. Oh, wow. Uh, national champion. Congratulations, Maddox. Wow. Uh, 
uh, Kylie Krugman, Kylie, do you stand? Kylie was our was the elementary 3D national champion. Wow. <laughs> and we have Keely Lord and Riley Brown in the back. They shot for our elementary team last year. They both finished in the top five individually. So wonderful. Wow. And our last one, our last individual playthrough was Easton Wall. Easton was a seventh grader last year. He placed third uh, in the nation in 3D, and he was also your Oklahoma State champion. Wonderful. How many bow hunters are in the group? Yeah, good question. How many want to be bow hunters? <laughs> good genes and good coaching. Yeah, great job. Congratulations. Awesome, thanks. Hey, Don, how are you wanting to do pictures? Okay. You don't think you can set them right here? Just wondering. You're the pro. You decide. I'm going to do it right now. I want to just I want to do it. Yeah, let's do it real quick. So they can, if they need to leave, they can. Go out there. Huh? Do they have their permission in this one? Hey, Don, let's try to do one right here. Let's try to stack them up there and we'll go to the food. How about that? And then you can and go to the lobby. Here? Yeah, scrunch in.
Thanks, Don, for letting me. Yeah, thank you, Don. Change the plan. <laughs> Next item is um, consideration to vote to approve, amend, reject, or take other action on the minutes of the August meeting. Move to approve. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Brewster. Aye. Commissioner Barwick. Aye. Commissioner Holder. Aye. Commissioner Zelt. Aye. Commissioner Dillingham. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner Gaddis. Aye. And we've got the director's report next. The stage is Katie. Thank you. Um, I'll first go to Brittany Preston's report of um, federal congressional issues. As you can imagine, um, really everything is focused on um, COVID budget and um, the Taliban right now in D.C. So um, a lot of things happening around there. The infrastructure package that's working its way through right now um, is, or, or the Senate moved forward, the passing of $1.2 trillion eight-year infrastructure bill. You can see there the only wildlife-related provisions that we were able to get in there are monies for interior and ag to deal with ecosystem restoration. We'll see if we're able to tap into any of that. Uh, remains to be seen. Also, wildlife crossings for um, surface transportation projects. So uh, that now sits in the House awaiting consideration. Um, I'll let you kind of read through the rest as you uh, are interested when it comes to what's going on in um, Congress, the House, the Senate. Again, most of it focused on um, budget, infrastructure, um, things, and then I think that's probably all that's worth uh, mentioning at this point in time. Um, you'll note that um, Corey is out right now. She and Wade are representing us over at the Capitol this morning as we're having our first um, legislative interim study, this one dealing with fencing. And um, so it's, uh, I think it's supposed to be, it'll involve Cattlemen's Association, Farm Bureau, and other, a number of others. Uh, the commissioners of the land office, school land commission, as people may know them, Department of Wildlife, other agencies that may do fencing, Department of Agriculture, others. I think it's going to be just kind of a comprehensive look at and roundtable discussion on fencing and how it's done and how different people do it in the state. Um, as you all know, we've had uh, uh, a few issues in the past, but um, I think once folks are educated on how we do fencing uh, within the department, they typically find that we handle fencing about the same way every other neighbor handles fencing out there on the landscape. And so um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to educate folks on how we do it. Um, the, while we're on the subject of the legislative update, uh, we've got another legislative um, interim study coming up next week on the 15th. That'll be to look at um, our proposals for license consolidation and streamlining and right pricing um, our licenses. And so we'll have a, a um, commission rules committee meeting following this meeting to dive into that in more detail, at least with those commissioners that serve on that committee. We'll go speak to um, this legislative interim study on some of the proposals that we're um, tossing out there and then um, kind of see how it goes. Maybe see if they uh, are interested in giving the commission the authority to set licensing and prices, which is something that we went after last session, fell a little short, um, or how we need to approach that. So be looking forward to that. Um, Representative Carl Newton and Trish Ranson from Stillwater went to the uh, Selman Bat Cave watch on August 7th and had such a ball that Representative Newton um, wanted to try to get another group, including the Lieutenant Governor, back out there the following week. Um, but the bats weren't cooperating. They start, they're heading south in big numbers now. So um, hopefully we'll get them back out there next year. Uh, Representative Burns joined, Ty Burns uh, joined us and the fisheries crew at Call Lake for a couple of days of electrofishing surveys. Um, some giant blue and flathead catfish were caught, as well as some teeny tiny ones that I wasn't sure how we even got in our net, but it was fun to go join the fisheries crew for a day of really hard work that included towing some boats, and apparently we need to get a little more money in the fisheries budget for, um, <laughs> for important equipment, right? Uh, and then you'll see there we participated in some ceremonial bill signings. 
Um, wrapping up in human dimensions, a bow fishing survey. Um, I know the results are kind of floating around. I haven't seen them yet, but we'll have that all summarized and wrapped up for everybody to take a look at. Um, they also uh, have, I think, completed six focus groups that were created to look at women and hunting and how um, the department communicates and engages with our women hunting constituency across the state. So I'm looking forward to um, results and more importantly recommendations from that. Um, counting or the uh, administration division's been busy, you can see there, with um, all kinds of claims and getting people, getting vacancies filled. We're down to 13 open full time positions, whereas I think at our peak a couple of years ago we were dealing with 40 or something, right, Amanda? So HR's been doing a great job chipping away at those and um, lots of stuff going on, lots of licenses being sold, um, on and on. Fisheries continue stocking, um, lots of electro fishing, staining, sampling, um, maintenance on department lakes, continue to work at Manning on the, on the pump station project. Um, the uh, C&E division wrapped up the first year of Outdoor Oklahoma Adventure Raffles. Uh, and that is closed and the winners have been notified. Um, this year, we generated more than uh, $224,000 in revenue off of that. So I noticed as Colin was going through his presentation, that's about the budget for kits every year, if you think about it that way. So not an insignificant amount of money that was raised in our first year of those raffles. I think it was wildly popular and um, I will announce that I just, after talking to the commanding general at Fort Sill last week, uh, it sounds like they are going to cough up at least one, maybe two bull elk um, hunt on Fort Sill Army Base uh, for us to throw into the raffle next year as well as to work with the foundation on using one to raise money as well. So we are excited about that one because the cow elk um, on private land hunt raised 70 plus thousand, 74 thousand dollars. Did you say a little louder? 70. <laughs> I didn't know if, awesome. if the private landowner wanted to be recognized or not, but the um, that one raised for a cow elk hunt 74 thousand. So you can imagine what a bull elk opportunity on Fort Sill, which is not open to the public. Um, so we're looking forward to. Um, giving somebody the opportunity to go after that buck of a uh, bull of a lifetime. Sorry, I was just chasing bucks last week. <laughs> um, uh, Dove Field locations, um, just, just some highlights. The uh, website has been updated with over 50 field locations that our biologists submitted and updated the website so folks can go on where to hunt, figure out where to go do some dove hunting on public lands, um, the fishing resources page that Skylar's been working on uh, have really been growing in popularity um, and Skylar's done a great job of adding information not just about where you can fish but also things such as where the bait shop shops are where you can camp um, some of those ancillary things that really help people put together the whole trip and package so um, also to brag on our C&E division folks but they had a great showing at their Association of Conservation Information, which is the national organization of, of communications and education folks. But our folks won four first place awards in um, the, the April the, uh, Wild Side that Gina puts together, um, the internal communications, uh, the roadshow map, uh, photography, scenic photography, Sarah Sutherland, Blake Podaskis. PSA and marketing work, um, the outdoors are always open, won a second place award, uh, prescribed fire workshop handout, won third place with Skyler. Skyler also won third place on a poster identifying antlerless mule deer. Um, Darren Hill won third place on his video feature on Tinkara fishing, and Sarah Sutherland won third in photography in the people category. So. I mean, they just cleaned up on the national awards this year, so kudos to C&E. Cool. Yeah. Wildlife Division has been 
busy, of course, in their normal end of summer maintenance work as well as the spruce up and getting everything ready for hunting season. This is really ramping up to be the busy time of year. Also completing late summer bat acoustic surveys at a number of WMAs. Um, we're hearing from the deer spotlight surveys, which are winding down on our wildlife management areas. Fawn production is looking good across the state. Um, wish we could say that on poult production, we can't yet. Um, the For turkeys, uh, they completed their initial meetings with researchers on the new panhandle pronghorn and bear research projects that we're getting ready to um, roll out. Um, law enforcement division getting a lot of training wrapped up so they can make sure they get all those hours in before the end of the year, including an environmental crimes class that was taught by DEQ. Uh, there'll be a lot of them that have been teaching and will be teaching hunter ed classes over the next uh, number of weeks, actually well into November when they start wrapping that up. So um, with that, I will just mention on the calendar that um, starting tomorrow, we kick off the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies National Meeting, which is our national organization. Uh, it'll be virtual this week, and then directors are getting together this weekend and first part of next week at, in Providence, Rhode Island, which was scheduled to host uh, all along before COVID hit. So some of us are at least are going to travel, get together there. Um, again, we'll have that Senate interim study next week, September 15th. I will remind you that um, October 11th will be the next commission meeting, so it's a week later than originally scheduled, and it will be at Panhandle State University, so we're able to um, tour the new gun range, really world-class gun range, that um, we uh, were able to help them build, providing 75% of the funding for that gun range. and. Um, I know they're looking forward to hosting us for a dinner the evening of the 10th, that Sunday evening there. And Rhonda, any other things? Uh, not yet, but in the next week or so, I'll have A lot of other stuff may be in the works, so we'll let you know. And then the, the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency's annual meeting is going to be in Roanoke, Virginia, October 17th through the 20th. So just a few things upcoming. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? <coughs> JD, I have a question. Yes. On the uh, interim study on fencing, do you expect a, a formal report or recommendations of any kind? You know, I don't know what to expect. We reached out to the legislators that are organizing that, and they um, didn't give us any kind of formal. I mean, it really sounded like it's going to be maybe a more informal roundtable discussion, and you never know. Sometimes out of those interim studies come ideas for legislation next, next session. Um, sometimes they develop a, a formal report to give out to everybody, and sometimes it's just informational and everybody gets educated and goes about their merry business. So we'll hopefully see um, Corey and Wade coming back from it soon and get a report from them and know more. Any other questions for JD? <coughs> Thank you, JD. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next thing is presentation of July 31st financial statement by Amanda Stork. Good morning, Commissioners, Chairwoman Gaddis, and Mr. Strong. Today I have for you the July 31st, 2021 financial statement. Gotta hold your mouth right. I know, seriously. Um, if you turn to the first report in your packet on page one, combined balance sheet for July 31st, 2021, the total liabilities is $21,730,438. Our total fund balance is $475,485,837 for a total liability and fund balance of $497,216,275 compared to last year as $437,687,920. For our combined balance sheets for our trust funds, our expendable trust fund balance is $43,454,352. Our non-expendable trust fund balance is $96,680,523. Our pension trust is $142,276,031. Our DC trust is $5,876,488 for a total of 
$287,394. Our combined statement of revenues, expenditures, and change in fund balance for July 31st. Our total revenue is $1,946,246. Our total expenditure is $5,163,088 for a total deficit of $3,216,842, and our total fund balance as of July 31st is $63,522,260, so 61.43% increase over last year. On page four, your combined statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance for July 31st. Our operating revenue is $1,543,566. Our operating income is $757,608. And tying back to our previous report of fund balance of $244,833,042, compared with last year, $219,203,115. Last report in your packet is the Wildlife Contributions Report, and the total for that is $7,592. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Amanda? <clears throat> okay, do we have a vote to, or a motion to approve? We move. Second. And the roll call. Commissioner Brewster? Aye. Commissioner Barwick? Aye. Commissioner Holder? Aye. Commissioner Zell? Aye. Mr. Dillingham? Aye. Mr. Kane? Aye. Mr. Gaddis? Aye. The next item, uh, presentation and recognition of our landowner conservationist of the year with Bill Dinkins, please. Thank you, Chairwoman Gaddis. And good morning, commissioners. Um, you know, we, we recognize a lot of folks uh, for different kinds of awards, but in my mind, the one that we're getting ready to talk about today is one of the most prestigious. I mean, as you all know, over 95% of the state is in private ownership, and if we don't have private landowners committed, dedicated to helping us with wildlife conservation, um, it just makes our mission pretty much impossible, to be honest about it. So today... Um, we're going to recognize a, uh, a private landowner. A little brief history about the program. Um, we take nominations from all divisions, and this year we received five different nominations for landowners of the year. Um, Brett Cooper is our private lands biologist for Northwest Oklahoma, also oversees prairie chickens for the most part. But, Brett, if you want to work your way on up here, um, Brett's going to show us a PowerPoint presentation, and then we will call up our Landowner of the Year and uh, present our plaque. Thanks, Bill. See if I can get this to work. So, R.C. Brown is the 2021 Oklahoma Landowner Conservationist of the Year. Uh, it's a nice picture of him I borrowed from all of the Alva newspaper. Location of his ranch is in northwestern Woods County. You, you can kind of see by the arrow or the, the kind of star up there at the top of Oklahoma map. He has about 6,700 acres that he manages up in there in the Central, Central Rolling Red Plains Resource Area. So you can kind of see what the ground up there looked like before his management, and, and you can see all the eastern red cedars, unfortunately, but the rest of the ground is great. There's plenty of sand sagebrush and native grasses in there, uh, but obviously that was, that was definitely reducing his habitat potential. So through some programs, through our department and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Partners for Fish and Wildlife program, that provided money and technical assistance for quite a few of the projects. He has done work really, oh, from 2000 to 2010, and he started a little burning, a little cedar cutting through there, but really he ramped it up in about 2010 
where they established fire guards and began a lot of burning. He's an active member of, a, of probably one of the best uh, burn associations in the state up there in Woods County. Very active member. Uh, he has cut and removed and burned more than 3,000 acres of eastern red cedar, which is quite a feat. Uh, and of course, approved the habitat there for lesser prairie chicken, northern bobwhite, and other upland obligate species. You know, in, in conjunction with that, you're removing all the cedars because you want to get the seed source from the riparian area, so you're also enhancing turkey or potential turkey roost in that same, same way. These are the areas that he's done since about 2010, and it's pretty, it's hard to tell on the map, but those are four to six hundred acre projects. Those are pretty big. So you're, you're looking at a lot of ground to cover there. The red at the bottom are his current year projects, current and future projects that we'll be funding. Because he's almost finished, getting pretty close. This is the process, so once again, you can see where the cedars are in the landscape. And after mechanical removal, either cutting them off at ground level, you just leave them lay, and then you stack them. And this is just some of the equipment. In fact, that one at the bottom right is one that they're still using. You don't see a lot of that. Um, the top left is, is a grinder, masticator, whatever you want to call it, but it actually grinds them to the ground. The next part of the process is once you've got them stacked, you want to conduct a prescribed burn because you leave all the, the seeds, and if you don't burn it, you're going to have cedar just come right back, back up after you've cut them, unfortunately. And of course at the end, then you've got this great open prairie where he's got a lot of native grass and shrub, uh, which is fantastic for wildlife and cattle, obviously. You can kind of see in the distance here where you can tell where his neighbor starts, unfortunately, because that'll be who we'll be working on next, is where the cedars start. Rick is also enrolled in our Oklahoma Agricultural Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances, and that is CCAA, and it's Something pretty important that's been going on since about 2012 or 13. He has the active certificate of inclusion, which basically just allows the landowner to continue his current farming and ranching practices and fire in the event that there's a, if a species is listed or is threatened or endangered. And part of that is we go and look at their grazing exclosures, which is kind of a neat deal. It's pretty easy, but the landowner just can take half the grass and leave half. It's pretty easy. Um, and that will allow for nesting habitat next spring for lesser prairie chicken. And that's a great grazing disclosure. It's pretty easy to put together. It's a round bale feeder with a cattle panel in, inside. It's real easy to tell. And this is the map that, uh, oh, one of our previous biologists, Alva Gregory, put together years ago, but it's, it's pretty neat because each one of those separated pastures would have a grazing exclosure in it, and that's part of his wildlife management plan. And again, we want to thank you, Rick, for all the work that you've done, because it's a lot of work. I, I well know I've cut cedars myself, so, you know, over 3,000 acres, and you're getting pretty close to the end, so... Great, and we definitely appreciate all the active management you've done. We really do for all the wildlife species. Absolutely. And also through promoting hunting through there, these are actually taken off his ground there. Um, and turkeys have been harvested on there also. So, I mean, there's, there's some pretty good hunting up there. Come on up, Rick. I come, yeah, forward. <laughs> R.C., under me, sir. Thank you. So, plaque says, presented R.C. Brown, Oklahoma Landowner of the Year 2021, in recognition for outstanding contributions toward wildlife conservation and habitat enhancement on private property. 
Thank you, sir. And if you would like to speak, or you're welcome to. Sure. Well, you I told Russ, I said, if you give me a microphone, I said, I can tell you all kinds of lies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deeply honored by this. I really am. Uh, I was, when I first got this phone call, or my phone service was slim to none out where I live. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a couple of messages from Russ and a couple from Brett, and I thought, well, I wonder what I've done wrong now, or are they out of money? <laughs> 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 but, uh, so I got a hold of Russ, and he said, oh, yeah, and told me about this, and then Brett, but uh, I really appreciate this, and uh, and I appreciate y'all's input, and Brett took over behind Alva, which Russ come out and saw me one time afterwards, or after Alva died, and do you know about where this is or that is? And I said, no, we just made a verbal deal. And he said, you keep cutting till it got extra money that the guy I get gave up on. And he said, well, it's yours if you want to cut. And I said, we're in the hunt. Let's run. <laughs> so that was one of them. Well, anyway, up there. But um, I really appreciate it. And I came here when I got out of high school. Uh, this kind of breaks me up. But I see Mr. Kane over there, and I did your family own land in Kiowa? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> His folks, and I don't know the full story, helped my granddad get started on the place in kind of west of the highway of 183 in Kiowa County. And he was there and managed it until he bought the place that I'm on now and that I brought out all the heirs anyway. But, uh, they were very instrumental in helping my granddad. That's awesome. And uh, I want to really thank you anyway. I could tell you a lot of stories about up there, some of these guys, but they'll probably duck their head. <laughs> So I want to say, as an Alva girl myself, uh, it's especially special to see Woods County folks here at this meeting, and especially to be honored. That's it's so cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. You all are doing a good job, and I think this deal with the Archer deal with these kids, I think that's a shooter. <laughs> we need more and more young people. That's the thing with us cowboying up there. Kind of, I'm the old guy on the block, but uh, we go to Comanche County and burn with a lot of those guys up there, and Vic probably knows a bunch of those that's up there. Ed Krogh is a big burn guy up there that y'all probably know of, and we burn with him, and uh, it's, it's just a great fellowship when everybody gets together, but it's amazing when I see these young people we don't have that many in our country, but those people in Comanche County, I mean, them kids, they know where their folks are burning that day. And I guarantee you, they've already, of course, they got phones now, but, you know, they know who can drive them down to where Dad's at. And they get on the front of those fire trucks, they call them porches up in our country, they build the rigs that they can stand out on the front of the fire truck right there. And that's where them little whackers want to be. <laughs> right on the front, on the porch. <laughs> so we've got some young burners coming along anyway that's real asset to this stuff. And uh, I got behind. I worked in oil field for 30 years to save what I've got. And my wife gave it and did what she could, but uh, but I'm thankful for all this stuff. Really am. And we thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you're doing a good job. And I appreciate all the help. Brett and Russ, they've been help too. You know. Anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
My dad used to drink coffee with him, I bet you. Anyway, <laughs> okay. I read them every, every Saturday morning. That's what they would do. He'd meet the Bible dance. <laughs> Funny to ask him if they met if they knew my dad. <laughs> Thank you all. Good job. Congratulations. Okay, next item. Um, got Bill Jenkins. Contributions to accrue. Thank you again, Chairwoman Gaddis. As I said, it's always a pleasure to see Laura. Because most of the time she's bringing a donation. So Laura, <laughs> you uh, you want to work your way up here? Hey, while she's on the way up here, JD, thinking back to that turkey hunt 30 years ago. If I recall, if I recall, we did have Jake come in. We did, but we passed. So That's I just right. want to get that straight for our NWTF folks. That's that right. I he did call in for Jake. <laughs> and I will admit, coming from Custer County, that it, I was a little claustrophobic in Atoka County too. I was like, how do you shoot turkeys in all these trees? <laughs> it's crazy. So, obviously, Laura, y'all know, are you getting a 30-year pen? No, oh, okay. <laughs> Just wondering, you seem like you've been here about as long as I have, but, you know, as we always talk about our, our great partnership with uh, Quail Forever, Pheasant Forever, and they always come through, and again, they will again today. So, I'll turn it over to Laura, she can talk about the donation. Week two here. Okay. Um, good morning, and um, thank you again for the opportunity to be able to um, help our, further our wildlife goals here, especially for quail. Um, one side note: I did not know when I talked to you early, earlier, Mr. Brown, that I actually know where you at, where you are now, because when I saw the map, I'm like, I drive by there all the time, <laughs> and every time we've seen those cut feeders. I'm like cheery because I know exactly what that means. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you for the hard work. I think I was thrilled to see that that's actually you who is the one that's been doing that. So thank you. So on to other business for um, for the department. And I'm always I want to introduce Dub Austin. He is the vice president of the Indian Territory chapter. I always encourage my chapters to be the ones who come to here um, in the check presentation just because they're the ones that do all of the hard work. He is one of the hardest working members of that committee and does a ton of stuff for the chapter and it's because of him and the rest of the chapter where we're able to be able to donate these funds. So today, the funds that are being designated, um, there's 6,000 for Spavinol WMA, there's 3,000 for Ulagal WMA, and then 1,000 for the STEP program, as you mentioned earlier. So um, the 6,000 is for funding and the PR match for Spavanol that'll be used to hire a fence crew to build approximately 10 miles of boundary and interior fence on the prairie portion of the WMA. The prairie will then be grazed under two leases to help improve the habitat for quail currently. And this is the key part. I don't think prior chapters I don't think had write-ups from their WMA managers explaining well enough and connecting it to why that's important for quail and the important part of this sentence right here is currently the vegetation is too dense to be prime quail habitat the grazing reduces the invasives in the overall vegetation so that's the 
the important correlation there. And so very important project. And then for Ulagaw, it's actually for to help match for mulching, and that is to help clear the boundaries for fire guards and reclaim the ag fields that are also too brushy. So that is a description of what the money's being used for. And I just want to say thank you for your hard work and great partnership. It goes both ways, <laughs> I promise you. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and Dub has the check. Did you want to say anything? No, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's usually yeah, true in the meetings too. Oh, okay. Arcee? Sure. Item number 14 is going to be postponed to a later meeting. Uh, number 15, any new business not properly foreseen? None. Okay, that being said, well, the, the next meeting is going to be Monday, October 11th at, at the Oklahoma State, Oklahoma Panhandle State University in Goodwill. That being all, I guess, thank you all for coming. Fishing, hunting, wildlife management, resource protection, habitat conservation, public outreach, and education. It's what we do. It's what we live for. Simply put, Conserving wildlife literally means the wise use of wildlife. And that's at the root of everything we do. Oklahoma is one of the most species diverse states in the nation. Making sure opportunities exist for hunters, anglers, and all those who appreciate wildlife is not only our job. It's our passion. We are your Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. From sunup to sundown, and sometimes all night long. 
The employees of our agency are relentless in their dedication to a job well done. The science behind wildlife conservation is constantly evolving. And our biologists are leading the way with groundbreaking and cutting edge techniques that the entire scientific community benefits from. If that's not enough to make you proud, then consider this. We've been doing all this since our agency's birth in 1909 without using a dime of taxpayer money. That's because the Wildlife Department is designed as a user pay, user benefit agency. It's sportsmen and wildlife enthusiasts who pay the bill for wildlife conservation in Oklahoma. Revenue from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses make up the majority of the agency's budget. There's also another unique way that outdoorsmen contribute financially. Each time someone buys a gun, ammunition, fishing equipment, or fuel for their boat, a small portion of the tax they pay at the register is used for wildlife conservation. But hunters and anglers don't just contribute financially. A long time ago, we recognize that sportsmen are our most effective management tool. Shaping regulations and making sure everyone complies to them has played a major role in bringing many species back from the brink of extinction to unimaginable numbers. As much as the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation has accomplished, we are positive our agency's best days are yet to come. You can see it on our faces. You can feel it with your hands. And you can hear it on the landscape.